Okay, welcome back everyone. I see people are trickling in from the break, so I'll get started with my announcements. So welcome back to the afternoon of our last day. Uh, we've got a couple of great sessions to close off the day today. I'm happy to introduce your moderator for this afternoon, Emily Pastrero. Emily is a uh, program coordinator at the Invasive Species Center as well. Uh, she works on a lot of different projects from spotted lanternfly uh, to if you joined in yesterday, you would have heard her presentation on municipal expenditures. Uh, so lots of hands and lots of different pots for Emily, um, but we're happy to have you take us through this afternoon. Uh, so I'll pass it over to you. Thanks. I hope everyone enjoys this session. Hey, thanks so much for the introduction, Mackenzie. Um, welcome everyone. Hope you've been enjoying the forum so far. Um, we're gonna delve into developments in research and management for invasive plants. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Brittany Day and Jamie Schnell from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And they're going to be talking about enhancing coordination in plant health updates on the Canadian Plant Health Council. Thank you so much, Emily. I'll just share the uh, presentation here. Perfect. Can you just confirm that you've got the right view of the presentation, Emily? Yes, looks good. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. So really appreciate the opportunity to present today. Uh, Brittany and I are going to touch on two initiatives that contribute to enhancing coordination in plant health. So that's the Canadian Plant Health Council, uh, which I'll touch on uh, and, and some of the results achieved by the council to date. And then I'll turn it over to Brittany to talk about uh, the Canadian Plant Health Information System and progress on its development. So the Canadian Plant Health Council uh, was created back in 2018 as an outcome of the plant and animal health strategy. Uh, so the, the strategy recognized the need for a coordinating body to uh, oversee implementation of the many activities that it had identified for uh, strengthening plant health in Canada uh, and emphasize that this coordinating body needed to be a multi-partner group that brings together industry, academia, uh, federal, provincial and territorial governments and non-governmental organizations and all the partners really that have a role in plant health to work together to deliver activities for strengthening Canada's plant health system. Um, and so that's how the, the Canadian Plant Health Council came to be formed. Um, and they uh, do a number of things to set priorities for plant health. And, and they've really formed a strong network of collaborative relationships uh, for those area, areas where partners really do need to work together for success for plant health. Um, since 2018, they have uh, had ongoing operational review as well. It's um, not easy bringing that diversity of partners and perspectives together. And so there was the idea to make sure the formula was right. And so there's there's been an ongoing uh, look at how the council is operating to bring about improvements over time. And some of those recent changes have included shifting to a strategic board of directors model, um, the council was also originally launched as a pilot to, to test out the model. Um, and now that we've moved beyond that, uh, there's been uh, some, some goals to, um, or a view to defining longer term goals as well beyond that pilot period, and also exploring uh, where additional resources can be located to support uh, the activities that are delivered by the council. So one of the key areas that the council does is to set those priorities uh, for coordinated actions. So the strategy, the plant and animal health strategy identified a wealth of activities and obviously everything can't be done all at once. And so there's a need to focus efforts to those key areas uh, where partner action can really bring about uh, results. And so the council does set those priority areas. Um, and since 2018, the, the three priority areas have been biosecurity, surveillance, and emergency response. Uh, so biosecurity is uh, really about looking at those on-farm actions to prevent the uh, entry and spread of plant pests and making sure that everyone is aware of their roles with respect to biosecurity practices. Uh, with surveillance, we're really looking to coordinate and harmonize all the different uh, surveillance and monitoring activities that are happening across Canada uh, so that we do have that risk intelligence to inform our actions. 
And then for emergency response, it's really about that multi-partner action, making sure we've got clear processes and trusted relationships so that partners can work together um, for rapid and effective responses to our plant health emergencies. The Council did re revisit the priorities in 2021 and, and reconfirm those as the three priority areas, but they additionally identified two important enablers. Uh, so one of, the, that, one of those is the information system that Brittany is going to talk about a little bit later on. Uh, the other one is partnerships, so the need to continue continually outreach to all partners to make sure everyone is aware and engaged um, in terms of, of the necessary actions uh, that are happening through the Council. Uh, and then the council did also uh, recognize two ultimate goals. So uh, that uh, bigger picture outcome is also important. Uh, so all of this work does go towards protecting Canadians. So making sure that our plant resource base is protected um, and mitigating against the economic and ecological losses that can affect the agriculture and the forestry sectors and all Canadians. Um, and then the other one is international trade. So making sure we have that strong domestic plant health system to support um, to support our trade uh, for agri-food and, and forestry sectors. So with my last two slides, I am going to touch on some of the results to date from each of those working groups. Uh, so starting with biosecurity, the biosecurity working group has uh, one of their first actions was to put together a repository of biosecurity programs and resources and tools. So really uh, did a comprehensive scan to, to list all of those because um, there's such a, a mosaic in place across Canada. So trying to pull them all into one central location uh, for ease of access and also to figure out where the gaps are. Um, so that's been a really great resource for the working group and, and it continues to inform their work moving forward. And they're now looking at ways to um, pull key pieces of those together. Uh, key, um, extracts from that repository, like communication products, for instance, and get that uh, somewhere uh, easily accessible in a central location. Another activity they did was a biosecurity survey in 2021 uh, targeted to producers to understand the level of awareness and uptake of biosecurity practices on farm. And so this has provided some baseline information to the group to, to understand where that's at, to ident identify gaps and, and barriers. And again, they're using this information to take a look at their work plan and, and see where to go next to help encourage um, increased uptake of biosecurity practices. The emergency response working group, they ultimately would like to develop a multi-partner emergency response plan. So uh, there's lots in place at the organizational and some at the bilateral and regional level, um, but there's no national level guide for how partners can work together for a plant health emergency. And so uh, that's what they are hoping to achieve ultimately, but uh, it's a lot to, to bite off. And so they focus their efforts as a first step on a notification pathway. So that is the channels of communication once a pest threat is detected, how do we bring the right players to the table at the right time and make sure that flow of information is, is proceeding uh, rapidly amongst partners. And so that pathway has been developed and there's ongoing work to, to validate it and further develop it and develop some uh, accompanying communication guidelines as well. And then we have the surveillance working group, which actually operates as three communities of practice. Um, each of these groups uh, selected a target pest and looked at how to coordinate existing surveillance and monitoring practices and enhance those existing practices as well. Uh, so the disease surveillance community of practice selected club root and did some, um, some work to standardize uh, disease severity ratings and, and develop a soil testing, uh, standardized soil testing for club root as well. The weed surveillance community of practice uh, looked at amaranthus species with a focus on common water hemp and also some work on Palmer amaranth as well. Um, and again, have developed a, a common protocol for monitoring of those species and a questionnaire to support some data collection. Um, and then the insect surveillance community of practice has developed a protocol for the cross host monitoring of European corn borer. And they also have a questionnaire that's online through survey one, two, three to allow for in the field data collection. Um, and so some of these uh, these initiatives have uh, been run over the last uh, one to two growing season, and we're continuing to work at uh, encouraging uptake of those to gather more data through those initiatives. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brittany to talk about the Canadian Plant Health Information System. Thank you, Jamie. 
Um, yeah, so for the second half of this presentation, I'll be providing an overview of the Canadian Plant Health Information System, or what I will refer to as CFIS for short. Um, so I think as we can all see with the results that Jamie's presenting there with the Canadian Plant Health Council working groups, these kinds of collaborative networks can really strengthen our collective ability to protect our plant resources. And so some of the cross-cutting information sharing and coordination that takes place in those networks, it can be strengthened even more when we have these types of new and um, modern technologies and platforms to enable those activities. And this is where CFIS can really play a role since it will be providing digital infrastructure to centralize information sharing and communication among a variety of plant health protection partners and stakeholders in Canada. And there will be four tools offered through the system that are listed there at the bottom of the screen. And I'll just take a moment to provide a brief overview of each of the tools in the following slides. So next slide, please. The environmental scanning tool is going to be offered through CFIS. It was developed by the National Research Council of Canada as a tool to automate scanning of online resources. So users will be able to search for keywords using this tool and results will then appear on an interactive map and graph uh, based on the locations that, that are appearing in that article. So this screenshot shows an example of a search result that was produced when searching for hemlock woolly adelgid articles within the last 30 days. And as you can see from the result that's on the screen here, it came from an article that was published by the US Daily Career Observer. And it's highlighting a community science activity for HWA on hiking trails this winter around the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario region. So as a user, if this article was of interest, I could highlight portions of the text. I could then also send it to other users in the system using a link in case it was of interest to other, other folks as well. And so this tool could really be a helpful way for not only scanning the web for news on pests of interest or new and emerging pests, but also just learning more about things like community science activities happening around the country and beyond. Next slide. The CFIS collaboration space is going to use MS Teams software to allow users to instant message, create discussion threads, and share and edit files. And I know that since the pandemic, pandemic and moving into a virtual work environment that a lot of organizations have adopted MS Teams already as a platform for their communications and file sharing. But the one great benefit that CFIS offers with using the software is uh, applying that functionality between partners from different organizations as well. So this could be useful for different collaborative networks, such as the council, um, different researchers maybe working on proposals together or various working groups. And it really would provide a spot to share and edit files and have instant access to different kinds of materials, such as presentations or webinar recordings and making sure that everyone has instant access to the most up-to-date versions of the material. Next slide. So expertise mapping, this will provide CFIS users with quick access to a catalog of different centers of expertise and laboratories across the country. The information is going to be displayed in an interactive dashboard, as you see here, that is powered through Microsoft Power BI, so that users can easily search and filter for information in a number of different ways, either using the maps or a search bar or within the graph. And so um, users could then identify different expertise or perhaps establish new partnerships using this tool. And next slide. And so the last tool that I'll feature here is the integrated data space. So it's actually going to offer a suite of tools that it will allow users to upload different types of data. So for example, surveillance or inspection data, the tool will then automatically integrate the data sets with those that have been uploaded from other users and then have the accessibility of visualizing the data on different maps or using different analytics and modeling tools um, to do different analyses. So the example shown here is using Power BI again, um, and it shows data from imports for a, an example commodity. And so this set of features is really expected to have a variety of applications uh, from exploring pest detections across commodities across the country, to also then perhaps planning surveillance activities if we know where things are being detected or where they haven't been searched for yet, and ultimately improving risk intelligence. 
Next slide. So when will CFIS be ready to launch? The system is currently within the development and testing activity stage, and we are doing this in a phased approach. So right now, we've just wrapped up our phase one pilot testing, actually just wrapped up last month, in which testers from both CFIA and some external organizations tested the initial set of features, including our registration process, the system landing page, environmental scanning tool, and the MS Teams collaboration space. So we've collected a lot of great feedback and we're using that feedback to work with our CFIA to IT team to make some final modifications to those tools that will improve the overall user experience and system performance. And phase two pilot testing is going to focus on the expertise mapping and integrated data tools. And that testing is planned for fall of this year. And we'll, and we'll do a similar feedback loop for those as well. There is also some less technical work underway this year to support the system implementation, including the development of information sharing agreements and a data management plan. And we're currently looking towards early 2024 for the full system launch. Next slide. So to ensure that CFIS will be a valuable resource for a variety of users, there are a number of organizations that we have been engaging during the system development and testing to date. There was a CFIS steering committee established in September 2021, which involves directors from a variety of federal and provincial government organizations, as well as academia representative representation and non-government organizations that expressed early interest in CFIS. And this committee is providing strategic oversight to the system design and implementation plans. We also have two working groups that we established last year that involve subject matter experts from a similar uh, group of organizations, and they're providing the support for the pilot testing and the development of data standards and management plans. And then, of course, we also have existing forums, including the Council and FPT Plant Health Committee, that we engage with regularly for feedback and to identify opportunities to apply CFIS leading up to launch next year. Next slide. And so I'll close with just a few final thoughts. I think it goes without saying to this audience, especially that the risks posed by invasive species are very complex. They're far reaching and they're complicated further with increasing threats such as climate change. And so addressing these kinds of risks effectively really require strong collaboration and knowledge transfer between experts and decision makers in this country. In fact, the Council of Canadian Academies produced a report earlier this year, or I guess earlier last year, <laughs> that emphasized this point by identifying that uh, governance appears to be one of the main categories of risk to plant health in this country. And so together, the Council and the CFIS have been working closely together to, have, um, to help address these gaps by providing a solid framework enabled through these strong partnerships and new digital infrastructure. Next slide. And so if anyone here is interested in becoming involved or simply learning more about the Council or CFIS, there are a number of ways to connect with us, including the, the general email accounts listed here, or also just reaching out to Jamie and I directly, I'm sure we'd be happy to have a conversation and, and tell you more about these great initiatives. Um, so with that, I hope this presentation was informative and may inspire some new partnerships to engage with us in the future. Um, and thanks for listening. We'd be happy to take any questions. That's great. Thanks so much, uh, both Brittany and Jamie. Um, we have just a few minutes for questions now. I do see one in the Q&A. Um, I think it might be answered by this last slide, but um, we we're just asking if you could send info on how to get connected with the emergency response program. So is that that first email address there? That's right. Happy to Happy to connect via that email address for sure, or contact me directly. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, I have another uh, question. I know you mentioned um, at the beginning a, a biosecurity survey that was disseminated. Do you have any maybe uh, key results that you're able to highlight from that survey for us? Yeah, it was. Uh... We, we do have 
the results and um, certainly it did provide that kind of baseline understanding in terms of of the levels of uptake, which were, were variable, um, I think, across the different sectors. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it did touch on some of the, the barriers, uh, you know, access to information, having the resources to put biosecurity practices in place. Those are some of the barriers that were identified from that as well. Okay. Would you say there are any other um, notable gaps, I guess, in biosecurity in Canada, if you're able to share? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I think one of the things we're we're definitely looking at, um, and that comes back a little bit to the repository, is that um, there's a lot of resources out there, uh, many at the provincial level, um, but perhaps not one one stop shop for all of that information. That kind of central central place that is well known and recognized to provide that information. And so that's something the group's actively uh, discussing right now to see if that's a gap that that uh, we can address through the Canadian Plant Health Council. Okay, well, great, thank you so much. Um, I think I will turn it over to the next speaker. Um, so next up, we have uh, Dr. Rojing Wang, also from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and she will be presenting to us today on digital references and tools for identifying seeds of invasive plants. Welcome. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so now I'm just sharing my screen. Um, yeah, to share my presentation. Um, so my colleague in, in programs of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in Plant Health Program, and I'm in um, the research um, uh, science branch uh, in um, a laboratory. So my uh, responsibility is to develop some method and our lab is doing um, a testing and uh, to detect invasive plant species. Um, so I just right away start uh, with my uh, presentation today. Yes, uh, I'm really is to introduce a uh, digital tools that can be used by not just a CFI testing and also all the private uh, commercial seed testing laboratory or any other um, institute we want to do this kind of uh, detection and identification of invasive species. So with that, I, I would first say in general, when we talk about invasive plants, um, in most people's mind is plants. Uh, the seed uh, sometimes is uh, less visible. However, all the plants is coming from seeds. So sometimes uh, the importance of preventing invasive plants from seed sometimes can be overlooked, especially in research and academic, uh, academia uh, community. Um, so uh, as the whole day talk about invasive plants. Um, so the, the plants will come from the seeds and seed can be spreaded intentionally and unintentionally. So for example, uh, previous speaker uh, talked about uh, the garden cell, they sell invasive plants, but they have a load of opportunity they are not for sale. However, they contaminated with our product. Um, uh, so usually is with, uh, especially uh, so now with uh, the trade across continent uh, around global. So uh, we find uh, invasive or unwelcoming uh, species are contaminated to seeds, grain, packing material, feed, or any other uh, agricultural material then can be through that pathway spread it. So we all know um, plants uh, need to be, uh, if one way, the strategy to prevent invasive plants is protection. So the protection started with regulation and we need to find a way to implement the regulation. So we are doing the um, prevention by uh, stopping the contamination of invasive seeds in different kinds of commodities. 
So this is just uh, illustrated in current regulation federally. Uh, we have visit order. We have the uh, pest regulated by Canada. Of course, when we do export, we, we will follow the other countries regulation. Um, so for that uh, enforcement of the regulation, so that means uh, we do need a checking of the um, different agricultural commodities uh, that contaminate, whether they are contaminated with regulated species. Uh, so high risk species is one is a seed for planting. So because they directly been planted, um, so they, if they have contamination of invasive species, then that will be spread very quick. Um, then the other one is green because green is a big volume. Sometimes some spill or something can be uh, bring some invasive species in uh, with their seeds. Uh, another high risk product is bird feed. And my colleague that just discovered the one, one she bought um, a bird feed and they have invasive regulated species right there. So that means the checking um, is really needed. So most people may not know, but uh, um, so there are uh, over uh, near 30 uh, seed testing lab, including um, this federal uh, lab. We are doing this kind of wheat seed detection and identification. Um, so it is really expertly oriented, it is very specialized area. So in many cases, uh, we don't have sufficient material to provide technical assistance to this kind of activity. So what we did is we, so since uh, 2010, we start to work on a web <coughs> application. <clears throat> so the purpose is to assist our um, uh, weed seed analysis laboratory to have some references. Um, so we needed this project, but we invited international collaboration uh, for this kind of uh, activity. So to my knowledge, this is the first in its kind. <clears throat> and the other country also have a similar product, but uh, do not have a wide open access and for end user and for collaboration. Uh, so we accept any um, expert from different parts of the world. If they want to do uh, publication, they can do this uh, digital uh, publication. So this slide just show, um, so this resource has been used over 40 countries. Um, so um, you can see uh, the US um, is big uh, user. And after that would be um, Canadian and other countries. Um, so with a little bit of introduction, I would uh, uh, show the real website to let people have a um, idea what kind of this web website um, it is. So this digital platform is to mainly is for detection uh, regulated species, of course, uh, regulation beside invasive species, there also have other uh, regulations, for example, crop, breeding, those kind of things. Anything related to seed morphology, uh, we put here. So for this um, tools, we have the, uh, the main product for end user is seed identification guide. And we also provide a publication guide to authors. Here we have many protocols, how, how to make diagnostic images, how to do measurement, how to describe morphology of different species, all different kinds of protocol is building for author to publish. And we also build in uh, training resources. So here is an open exercise but we made some interactive exercise and people can go there, do some exercise. And we also have forum. If people have something they couldn't identify, they can 
upload their image and also uh, some expert in the background to provide um, kind of help. So for end user, this is our uh, main product. So here is uh, when people want to identify invasive species uh, in a seed form, then you have a few tools you can use. So here have identification fact sheet, and also we have identification key, and also have a gallery. So gallery is images of um, different species. Um, so people come here, then you can see different species, then some are regulated, some are not regulated. So the purpose is um, when people see something similar as regulated, then you can say there have many similar species. As you all know, for plant identification, you have to separate all those similar species. And here, because we also, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, we also publish our product in this digital platform. So, so far, uh, we did most of the regulation, regulated species. For example, here is the um, we seed order class one species. This is a, a prohibited noxious weed. It should be a zero tolerance in any community seed lot. Um, so those are the species um, that is regulated. So in all uh, federal or uh, commercial seed labs, they have to detect, um, to search for those species uh, in different commodity. So then when they want to know um, if they're um, this joint to the gold grass, so they can come here to have a training or have a regular reference to say what they look like. And because this is a diagnostic images, we try to provide sometimes the seed come up with a different form. It could be uh, Spaclets could be uh, caryopsis, it can be different kind of forms. So we try to provide those. We provide also distribution information and crop association. So that information, beside morphology information, it also help testing lab to narrow down what kind of uh, possibility in this sample. So if you have this uh, associated crop kind from those kind of habitat. So that gave you a clue, have a high chance. You could have those species uh, um, contaminate with the product for, from those area. So those kind of information just provide uh, testing specialists to, to come here to, to know um, their biology and also know the key uh, um, <clears throat> the seminoles is a uh, different dispersal units. So they can come here and have a different, uh, uh, look at the different structure of the seed than that uh, identification. And there have identification keys depend on uh, where you are. Um, we only have a few key available at this point. But uh, the key is different from the traditional taxonomy key is because we, uh, our intention is to help for private lab. So, um, and testing specialist, they are not necessarily has a taxonomy background. So we more use the um, morphology question oriented uh, key. So it's called music key. So basically you have to select picture. Uh, if you have unknown seed, then you come here, you select all oh, the seed is round. So you select the shape. So you can see how many we have 26 family. So you can see um, 10 with one feature selection, you can see 10 uh, family was excluded. So potentially you have 20, 26 family over there. So you keep going with the answering different kind of question here, then you can narrow down which family it could be. So this is the first step to help for identification of a unknown species. 
And uh, if you keep going, then we could have other uh, materials, um, uh, other ways. Uh, one more ID tool or keys is available, then people able to identify more uh, accurately. We have another key that's developed by um, colleague from Australia. So this one is mainly for Asteraceae. And uh, most people know many of the invasive species coming from Asteraceae. So then if you wondering whether it is a certain species, we can use this key there. Um, so uh, beside that, um, this, um, this uh, website also have um, guidance for author because we are looking for more and more professionals. They can uh, share your knowledge about invasive species and invasive seeds. Um, so you can come here. We try to use a standard approach um, to develop some protocol for for author to use. So here have some data collection protocols. Um, so if you are interested, uh, even when you just submit as uh, images, it could help analysts to understand uh, what species what they look like, especially for invasive species. Usually, it's coming from other countries may not widely distributed in Canada yet. So that is really hard for most of the testing lab to know those species. They are normally doesn't see. So if any studies, any people study invasive plants, um, if you have seeds and you can make images to share with the diagnostic lab, but how to make images here is protocol. And also we are actively reaching out sometimes all the private lab uh, needs some training material we don't have. Then we would uh, ask some field biologists provide us some, some seeds, then we can use those seeds, study them and generate some morphology data, then share with detection and identification laboratories then uh, the knowledge can be shared, then can be used for diagnostic testing. So we have been contacted a few biologists in DC, I believe in the States. Um, um, they are very um, generous and help us um, to get those specimens. And then we're able to um, provide all regulated species uh, in community uh, regulation. Um, at this point, at least the, the, the digital specimen were like this. We, we could provide the images uh, as a digital specimen for analysts to use. Um, so um, if there have a more taxonomy expertise, you definitely can come here and share your expertise. And we also prefer the uh, standard approach um, because each person morphology is difficult to describe um, the morphology. So we developed some, some chart for the author to use. So those chart just gave um, some kind of a semi-quantitative kind of uh, description and people can use those standard words to describe. So this is not just for author, and it also help for the end user, they can use them. So I'm not sure what is my time. Can I continue? Um, you have maybe just about a minute left. Um, we might have a minute for, for questions if you wrap up now. Okay, so definitely I encourage everybody to come to this website, either use it or contribute to it, um, yeah. So that's all I'm going to talk about and you can ask questions while I can do some exercise and just show you. That was great. Uh, yeah, thanks, Dr. Wang. It looks like a really um, good resource. I don't see any in the Q&A, but um, I just wanted to know, um, do you think, does this website, uh, idc.org, um, have utility maybe for uh, students who are doing research? 
Um, yes, uh, I, I think we are actually, when we developed the fact sheet, we, we do uh, hire a few students to help us um, because our expertise is more in a seed morphology expertise. Um, however, um, uh, for the biology of that species, where they distributed, uh, which country is regulated, all those kind of uh, information, or we do hope students can help. So because I'm in um, uh, Saskatchewan, so we kind of work with the University of Saskatchewan. We ask the students if they have like a, um, a, some kind of a field work, they can combination with this one then we could tell them what are the species we're interested in, so they can search all those biology of that species for us. Um, like I showed before, um, the, um, the, the fact sheet, what, what we need is the, the crop association or the, the species, what kind of habitat they grow, um, any potential to be be invasive in what kind of situation. Um, so those kind of information, um, definitely students can help. Okay, well, great. Thank you so much for answering that question and for presenting today. Um, I am pleased to introduce our next presenter. Uh, we have Mia Akbar from Queen's University and they're going to be speaking to us today about purple. <laughs> Purple loose strife as a model system for plant invasion, evolution, and management. Thanks, Emily. I'll just share my screen. Excellent. Um, all right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Mia Akbar, and I'm joining uh, you today from Kingston, Ontario. Uh, which is situated on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe. Um, I'm very grateful to live and learn and conduct science here as an uninvited guest. Uh, um, I'm currently working on my master's at uh, Queen's University um, under the supervision of Dr. Rob Kaladi in the biology department. And today I will be presenting some of the past, uh, current and future work of our research group. Um, so to begin, I would like to introduce you to this very pretty but problematic plant um, that um, I'm sure you've seen before, either in person or in some of the earlier presentations today. Uh, so purple loosestrife is a wetland perennial plant. Um, it's often found in ditches, um, meadows, marshes, uh, alongside lakes. Um, disturbance is what germinates the seeds, so that's why it's so commonly found in areas uh, where uh, humans have created a disturbance. Um, and uh, when purple loosestrife initiates flowering, it switches from um, this vegetative growth uh, to it um, buds, uh, flowers, and fruits. So it's at the height that it is at at the end of its vegetative growth is uh, the height that it remains for the rest of its life cycle. Um, and it can produce upwards of 2.7 million seeds per year. Uh, purple loosestrife is um, native to Europe and Asia, and it was introduced in the 19th century um, or earlier. That's just what we have um, earliest documented um, through multiple routes, uh, ship ballast, imported livestock, uh, seed for gardens, beekeeping. Um, and it's still used today as an ornamental plant um, in like different morphs in Canada, actually. Um, it's spread across North America um, and uh, rapid, however, all, Something that's interesting about this plant is that although it was introduced, you know, in the early in the 19th century, um, we've only seen this rapid spread in the last 50 to 70 years. Um, now, I'm sure that everyone attending this conference is, is well aware that the effects of invasive species can be incredibly taxing on both biodiversity and the economy and purple loosestrife is certainly no exception. Um, it's squeezed out many native plant species and has been the subject of many expensive management programs. Uh, it's probably um, best known for its biological control program. Um, uh, Biocontrol is the use of a species' natural enemies, so herbivores, pests, pathogens, parasites, to manage or reduce invasion. Um, and between 1992 and 1996, a control program was developed and facilitated that involved the release of these two specialist leaf beetles um, and one weevil. 
um, to various stands of purple loosestrife across um, Eastern North America. The problem that we see though, is that there is this huge variation in the success of biological control programs. So in some stands, it's been recorded that upwards of 90% of biomass has been reduced, but in others, it would appear that the biocontrol has little to no strong effect and individuals are able to survive and reproduce and persist despite the beetle. Um, here, uh, I have a figure where um, a, a recent uh, study did a follow up to some of the field sites that the beetle was released to. Um, and we see that over time, there's a, like a general trend of decrease in um, total uh, percent purple loosestrife cover, but there's still a lot of uncertainty in these measurements. And also something that's noteworthy is this is all within relatively the same geographic area. Um, and we see that there's like a huge variation in um, uh, purple loose strife uh, percent cover even across this axis. And this uh, indicates that there are a lot more things affecting these plants than just herbivore pressure. So as ecologists and evolutionary biologists um, in our lab, one of the things that our research group wants to know is, is why we see this variable evolutionary response to biocontrol. What factors, both biotic and abiotic, influence rapid evolution of this plant? Meaning why do some of these plants seem more resilient to herbivory uh, than others? And what makes it so that these plants can grow such a, across such a wide range? Um, and then do these things interact? Um, we're also curious, of course, if the responses from North American purple loosestrife, so introduced purple loosestrife, differ in the, to the re responses um, of European purple loosestrife. And if we're able to answer some of these questions, we may be able to provide a better information for managers to use when developing a framework for the implementation of biocontrol programs, not just in purple loosestrife, but in invasive species systems at large. Um, to answer some of these questions, our research group is uh, using a highly intersectional approach um, that aims to attack this problem from multiple angles, if you will. Um, we've, uh, we're doing some mathematical modeling, um, genomics and transcriptomics. Uh, we're utilizing both quantitative and, and population genetics techniques, which use uh, field experiments and then also some more molecular work. Um, and to this end, we aim to contribute to the purple loosestrife model system so that it can be used to answer important questions about the ecology and rapid evolution of introduced species and create empirical evidence that can inform mitigation and, and management efforts. So some of the things that we've um, learned in our research so far is that um, growth and timing of reproduction uh, is highly variable in the introduced range of purple loosestrife. And specifically, we see plants from the northern end of the range, uh, where it's colder and the growing season is shorter, um, stay small and flower early in the growing season um, in order to complete a full life cycle before the first frost. Um, and conversely, plants from the southern end of the range have a, lo a longer growing season. Um, they can take their time um, it, to get nice and big vegetatively before they shift to the flowering uh, part of their life cycle um, and then ultimately produce um, more seeds. Um, and this pattern is consistent across latitudes where northern genotypes flower earlier and they're smaller and southern genotypes um, are uh, flower later um, at a larger size. Um, and we see uh, when we grow these plants in a common garden experiment, a specific call, as one called a reciprocal transplant experiment, where we plant northern genotypes in the south and southern genotypes in a garden in the north, and then do one in a mid-latitude, uh, we see that this variation is genetic because when northern plants are grown in the southern range, they still flower early. And when southern plants um, grow in the north, they don't flower early enough and as a result aren't able to complete a full life cycle before the end of the growing season. And we see here that they're not able to produce as many seeds. So reproductive fitness here is, is just um, the seeds that they're able to produce. Um, in evolutionary biology, we call this a genetic constraint, meaning that there is a limit or constraint on the way that this plant can respond to its environment. So because of its genetics, the Southern plants can't flower earlier 
um, when grown in the northern environment. And because of its genetics, the northern plants can't hold off on flowering even when they're in a southern climate um, in order to produce more seeds by the end of the growing season. So in this way, genetic constraint imposed by climate adaptation changes the way that purple loosestrife can evolve. Um, and these genetic constraints may limit the ability of purple loosestrife to evolve in response to herbivore pressure and may explain some of this variability that we see in biological control programs. Um, so studies that investigate how biotic and abiotic uh, selection pressures interact to promote rapid uh, adaptive evolution um, are lacking. Um, but a recent mathematical model demonstrated that this interaction between biotic uh, being um, purple, like the beetles, and abiotic factors such as climate um, affect species range limits and adaptation potential. So these bubbles uh, here just represent um, what we call niche, niche breadth, so where a species is able to exist and the extent in which it can survive and persist. And then on these axes are just varying uh, gradients of intensity. Um, so this, uh, this type of mathematical modeling uh, demonstrates that multiple environmental variables simultaneously affect species ranges, and this can also lead to trade-offs where the response to one variable might also affect the response to another one. Um, however, it's critical that empirical studies in natural populations are conducted in order to complement and validate some of these um, mathematical analyses. Um. So some of the future and current work that we're doing right now to investigate uh, this genetic constraint on the herbivore response um, is uh, growing um, multiple different plants um, in, a, in a common garden. So we've sampled plants um, from uh, the northern end of um, the range in purple loosestrife. Um, this is uh, the, our most northern side is Timmins, Ontario, all the way down into the mid latitude in the United States. And we have various seeds planted in a common garden at the Queen's University Biological Station, which is about an hour north of Kingston. Um, and we've been, we're entering our seventh year of the common garden experiment with uh, 2000 plants. Um, we spray half with insecticide and the other half we subject to insect herbivory. And then we compare uh, the evolutionary response from them um, by measuring the seeds that they're able to produce at the end um, of the season. So if we're able to identify a difference in defense mechanisms um, at both uh, the quantitative level here um, and also the molecular level, um, because we'll be taking some of these samples and doing a transcriptome um, and genomic analysis on them to see if there's a difference um, between early and late flowering plants um, in uh, their genomics and um, in their transcriptomics as well. Um, that could support, uh, that difference could support the introduction of uh, potentially a more aggressive biocontrol to specific regions, or at the very least, um, allow us to predict where purple loosestrife might become a problem in the future. Um, finally, I would just like to take a step back from the purple loosestrife study system and consider other uh, invasive plant systems and invasive species generally. Uh, one of the primary objectives of our research group is to conduct science that is applicable to real world problems and interpretable by real world problem solvers. Um, the rate of uh, invasions is steadily growing and climate change will only exacerbate these issues. So our goal is to use purple loosestrife as an evolutionary model for invasive species and provide empirical evidence that managers can use to make decisions, but also predict how native plants will respond to the myriad of novel pressures that they're going to be experiencing under anthropogenic climate change. Um, with that, I would just like to acknowledge um, some of my colleagues um, and my advisors um, and all of uh, the current and uh, former members of our research group. Um, I, uh, it, it, I'm real, it, the privilege of working with such a large data set um, is not lost on me. There's a, a lot of work that had to go into, especially that common garden in the past, so that um, I could get to ask some of these cool questions. Um, and with that, I will take some questions. Hey, thanks so much, Mia. Um, we do have uh, a bit of time for questions, so I don't see any in the Q&A yet, but please um, put them in there. Uh, we are a little bit ahead of time. Um, I will maybe pose a question to you, which I know the answer to you too, because we've spoken before, <laughs> but uh, maybe just in case it's uh, of interest to our audience. Um, 
so you mentioned early in your presentation that uh, you know the purple loose strife was um, introduced early on, but then didn't uh, have this rapid expansion until the 1950s. Mm -hmm. um, was this because of climate becoming favorable, um, or what do you think happened there that caused that rapid expansion? Yeah, so there, like, there's not a, a simple answer to that question, and that's like part of what our research is trying to figure out. Um, but uh, it could be um, like a case of just like yes, like climate becoming um, favorable, but also like classic population genetic theory kind of outlines that there has to be a certain amount of genetic variation um, in every population. Um, for in order for natural selection to act on it and evolution to happen. So what I mean by that is in order for like a natural selective pressure, like the climate to say this plant is going to do better and this one's going to be the one that survives, they have to be different from each other. So it and when there's only small populations, genetic variation is very low. Genetic variation is only something that we get to see with um, larger populations. Uh, so it could have just been a matter that more and more needed to be introduced. And it just got to the point where, um, in the 1950s, it was this like perfect storm of, uh, ornamental plants being introduced, um, and maybe climate that allowed purple loose strife to expand its range, um, so rapidly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, we've got lots happening in Q&A &A now, so we'll try and uh, get to them. Uh, so can you talk more about how this model will help us understand native species responses to climate change? Certainly. Um, so uh, if um, we're able to uh, understand um, like the constraint, like how uh, different evolutionary pressures and impose constraints um, on plants in general, um, we can hopefully extrapolate that to um, native systems. So part of the reason why invasive species are such a, a cool study system is because they're outside of their native ranges. And we think of evolution um, historically as this like very like long and slow process. Uh, that happens over time. But like with purple loose strife, we see that it can actually happen very quickly. Um, in a very short period of time, we see this like climate adaptation where these plants, you know, have a very different um, flowering time and a like scale of reproduction. Um, so native plants will also be experiencing all of those novel pressures that invasive spe species experience when they're introduced to a new environment. Um, under the situation of anthropogenic climate change, because things are going to be getting warmer, extreme weather events are going to increase. So if we understand how invasive species respond to new pressures, then we can understand how native species will also respond to the new pressures of anthropogenic climate change. Good answer. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, uh, so this person was wondering if you were counting the stems of the loose strife, single stem versus multi-stem plants, in addition to counting seeds. Um, all of the above. So we have um, measurements across years where we're measuring uh, the length of the stems. So like that's the vegetative and then the floral and then the fruits like as time goes on um, and multiple stems because uh, part of purple loose stripes adaptation to herbivory is that um, it does, they do get shorter, but then they just grow more, um, like they suspend uh, like apical growth where they grow up and then they just grow more lateral stems and get like nice and big and bushy. So we measure multiple stems, not just the main floral stem. Um, good question. And uh, what we measure in terms of seeds is what we call like total reproductive biomass. So at the end of the season, we harvest the seeds um, and then we weigh, we dry them and then we weigh them. Um, although one of my colleagues right now is like working on a, a different experiment, which actually does involve her counting seeds um, for uh, her experiment. And what we're really hoping is that um, the seeds will be like have some kind of positive relationship with the total reproductive biomass. And that way, all of that data that we've collected in the past years can also um, be relational to like total number of seeds produced. But as you can imagine, it's a lot of work to do things like that. So it's not something we've been able to do for every year of the experiment. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, this is one I'm also curious about actually. Um, what is the state of purple loosestrife populations in Canada in 2022, 2023? 
Um, highly variable. And I don't actually, I definitely don't have a perfect answer for that, despite the fact that it's my study plan. Um, anecdotally, uh, I still see it in roadside ditches all the time. Um, I know that there are like dense strands of it um, that uh, exist kind of in like the Rideau Lakes area. Um, but the most recent field survey that I have found that's been published for Purple Loose Drive um, was actually um, hasn't there hasn't been one recently published within the last like two or three years. So um, but that might change. Um, so stay tuned to the Claudia Lab where we'll hopefully be doing some of that soon. I'll ask maybe just one more very quick question and sure. then the rest, um, if you can just type it in the Q&A box. Uh, could this lead to more predictability about which invasives will quote unquote explode in the future? Um, I think so. Um, the I think especially something like that will hopefully like the, a way, a, part of how our approach will enable us to do that is because it's so uh, multifaceted. It's not just, a quantitative genetics experiment where we're measuring um, like those those traits. It's not just a molecular experiment. We're trying to combine all of those things um, to really uh, like see what is what makes this plant tick and what makes the evolution in this plant uh, like how evolution has gone in this plant. So hopefully, um, it, we will like that's that's the goal of um, to make predictions to extrapolate to other invasive plants as well. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for answering all those questions. There's a couple more for you in the Q&A. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. We have Ian Jones from the University of Toronto stepping up next, and he will be speaking to us today about uh, leaf roll gall formation in invasive knotweed and its implications for biological control. Thank you very much, Emily. Let me just... Uh... Yeah, my screen. Okay, so is that coming across okay for you? There we go. Uh, oh, now it's full screen. Okay. okay, you're good. Perfect. No, well, thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here and thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to talk today, as Emily said, about um, biological control of invasive knotweed um, and specifically I'm going to talk about this leaf roll galling uh, that we're seeing in response to the feeding by a newly collected line of the biological control agent Apollara itadori. So just to give you a, a, a broad overview of the talk, I'll give you a quick background into invasive knotweed and the biological control agent Apollara itadori. I'll go over some of the obstacles we've come up against when trying to get this agent established and the subsequent collection of a new line of these psyllids by CABI UK. There are collaborators in the UK that started this biological control program uh, 20 plus years ago in the UK. So I'll then get onto the main body of the talk, which is to describe four experiments that we've conducted in the last year or so. So those are three growth chamber experiments and one field experiment. And they're all to kind of get at these two major questions. So the first one is, what are the behaviors in Aphalara itadori, these psyllids, biological control agents, uh, that cause the leaf roll galling in knotweed? And secondly, are these leaf roll galls important for Aphalara itadori survival? And then I'll finish off with some broad implications for the biological control program. But I wanna focus in a little bit on the why, why are we doing this work and, and why can it push the biological control program forward? So essentially understanding how and when these leaf roll galls form uh, can allow us to modify the way we conduct ourselves in the biological control program. Things like release timing, release numbers, the kind of uh, locations that we release in. And changes to that methodology can maximize the galling that we see in field sites. And hopefully where we see uh, more galling, we'll see more uh, chance of establishment and effective knotweed control from these biological control agents. So a very quick background into invasive knotweed. I'm sure most of you are, are fairly familiar, um, but like many of the invasive plants that we talk about, um, it creates these single species stands that have devastating impacts on native vegetation, native arthropods and, and more. 
Um, knotweed in particular grows very often along uh, water in riparian habitats. Um, and it has, although it has very robust roots, they're not very fibrous and they tend to allow a lot of soil erosion. And so that has an impact on uh, water quality and um, aquatic uh, assemblages of organisms as well. So I mentioned that knotweed has these very robust root systems. And the picture on the right shows knotweed essentially growing through tarmac. Um, and this is another thing that has a huge impact on, um, on the economics of controlling knotweed, uh, its effects on infrastructure. So this is the biological control agent. As I said, the program has been going on for over two decades now. Um, and the only insect that's ever been approved for release on invasive knotweed is Aphalara itadori. It's this psyllid. It's, a, it's called a, jump, a jumping plant louse. So it's essentially a kind of looks like a tiny grasshopper. They're about two, they're about two to five millimeters long uh, as adults. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, that gives you a better picture of what they look like. And we started releasing these, or they were released, uh, starting in 2010 in the UK, then in, Ca in Canada in 2014, uh, and in the US in 2019. And there have been extensive release programs in all of those locations. Um, for example, in Canada, we've released about a quarter of a million of these insects to date. But despite these kind of extensive re uh, release programs, we've never seen long-term establishment of these insects over multiple growth seasons uh, in any part of its introduced range. And the main reason for that seems to be uh, high levels of mortality in the juvenile stages of these nymphs, these psyllids, sorry. So it's the nymphal stages that we're having trouble with. And the major issues seem to be desiccation. Many psyllids in their juvenile stages are quite prone to drying out in the wrong kinds of conditions. Predation is another one. Experiments in Canada have shown that um, native predators have a significant impact on, on these psyllids. And there's also the effects of long-term captive rearing. What I mean by that is these insects were collected originally from Japan in 2004, and they've been reared in captivity ever since. And what tends to happen and what we believe has happened is that over time, we're selecting for individuals that uh, perform better on the kind of very tender, very nutritious leaf material that they get on greenhouse plants. Um, and then when we release them in kind of quite stressful conditions out in the field on late season knotweed that as many of you will know can kind of feel like leather or sandpaper, they're performing much less well. So it's partly because of this that Cabby UK went back to Japan in 2019 and collected a brand new population of these psyllids from a central uh, area of Japan called Murakami Prefecture. So what was immediately exciting about these Murakami psyllids, I'll call them from now on, uh, was that in the field, it was noticed very early that feeding by these psyllids was causing this impressive leaf roll galling damage. So you can see what I mean on the left-hand side there, leaves curl up on themselves and the nymphs very evidently like to hang out on these curled leaves. What's exciting about them is that not only do these leaf roll galls stunt plant growth, which is obviously what we want for biological control, but by generating these kind of uh, sheltered, maybe more humid environments, they can potentially mitigate uh, against all of those mortality factors that we that we acknowledged and, and recognized earlier on. So desiccation and predation by creating these kind of sheltered environments and also the effects of long term captive rearing. It's well known that many galls on plants have higher nutritional value than other leaves and particularly galls like this tend to have kind of very um, kind of supple soft leaf material that's probably ideal for the, the young developing nymphs. So as I said, I'm going to uh, describe four um, experiments, three growth chamber experiments and one field experiment, just briefly, that get at these two major questions. The first one being, what are the behaviours in these psyllids that cause leaf roll galling in knotweed? So the first experiment looks at the effects of psyllid feeding on knotweed leaves of different developmental stages. So on the left hand side here, you can see three different developmental stages of a knotweed leaf starting with A, which is a kind of completely new leaf that's just kind of breaking out from the leaf bud. Then you have B, which is a leaf that's become slightly unfurled, 
and then C, the leaf is completely uncurled but not yet expanded. So on each of those leaf developmental stages, we introduce psyllid nymphs, either one, three, or 10 nymphs. And then we isolated those interactions in mesh jewelry bags like this. So what you're seeing on the right there is one replicate with a brand new early developing leaf. So we have those psyllids on the leaves. We then just observe that interaction over the course of two weeks. And we, we record whether or not we see leaf roll galling. And also we score uh, the degree of galling on a scale of one to four. So that's the scale on the right there. One being a kind of small nick in one part of the leaf and four being a leaf that's almost entirely curled up on itself. So this is what that data looks like. So you can see the, the bars here are clustered uh, in terms of leaf developmental stage. And the different shades in those bars represent the numbers of leaves that galled at different intensities, so between one and four. In fact, we never saw a four, so it only goes between one and three. But what you'll notice immediately from the data is that most of the galling that we observed happened when we introduced nymphs to brand new early developing leaves. We saw some on slightly older leaves, but by the time the leaves were fully uncurled, uh, we saw no leaf galling in response to psyllid damage. So what this tells us is that if we want to generate leaf galling in the field, we need to make sure that psyllids have access to very young developing leaves. And that's how we're gonna maximize that at release site. So our second experiment then looked at which life stage of Aphalara itadori is most responsible for the development of these galls. So it's a very similar experiment, this time just focusing on those very young leaves that we know um, are prone to galling. And then in each case, we had four different treatments where we added um, psyllids of different life stages. So you can see those treatments along the bottom of the slide there. So we have early instar nymphs, late instar nymphs, adults, and then controls where no psyllids were added. And we, we added four psyllids in each case. So we then just recorded what proportion of leaves galled in each of those cases. And what we found was we saw leaf roll galling in response to feeding by all different life stages of the psyllids. So they're all capable of producing leaf roll galls, but the most galling by a long way happened when we introduced early instar nymphs. And the reason for that seems to be a behavioral one. Um, when we introduce early instar nymphs, they immediately migrate to the kind of rolled leaf edge, and that's where they do their feeding. The later instars, they tend to feed on more haphazardly on the leaf, but often even on the petiole, where they then don't have the impact of, of generating these leaf roll galls. It's worth saying as well that we didn't see any galling on leaves that we that we didn't include any psyllids. Uh, so there's likely no kind of um, systemic galling effects going on. So the second question we wanted to try and address was, uh, are leaf rolls important in Aphalara itadori survival? So if we generate these leaf roll galls, can it actually improve their survival in the field? Might it be a factor that aids their establishment in, in release sites? So the first experiment we did was a growth chamber experiment. We took mature knotweed leaves and in the treatment leaves, we created an artificial gall, which you can see on the left hand side. So it's very simple. We just fold over a two centimeter portion at the side of the leaf and hold it in place with hair clips. So they then have this kind of artificial shelter that we've created. The control leaves, on the other hand, we have the hair clips as a control, but no artificial gall. As with the previous experiment, those leaves were then uh, isolated in jewelry bags so that the psyllids couldn't escape. And then we uh, included four adult psyllids on each of those leaves. So after four days, we removed those psyllids and then counted the number of eggs that we had on all of our experimental leaves. We then followed those leaves for five weeks um, and essentially followed the progress of the resulting nymphs um, to see how many would survive and where on the leaf they tend to go. So I'm not going to show you the raw data for this one uh, because I don't want to kind of bog you down with too many graphs on a during a short talk. But I think the results are pretty well summed up by this photo. So what you're seeing here is one of the artificial galls that we've opened up after four weeks of the experiment. And what we see is huge amounts of nymphal feeding inside those artificial galls and very little outside. Over the course of the experiment, we 
essentially found that virtually no psyllids survived on the leaves without artificial galls. And the psyllids that did survive on treatment leaves with artificial galls, virtually 100% of them were inside those artificial galls by weeks four and five. So it showed us pretty clearly that those kind of enclosed, sheltered, perhaps more humid environments were beneficial, if not necessary, for the survival and development of those silly nymphs. So the final experiment we, we carried out was a field experiment, very similar um, in concept. So this was in a patch of bohemian knotweed in the UK, and we sleeved 60 branches of knotweed. And the treatments looked like this. So pretty similar to the lab experiment, the treatment branches, we created artificial galls on four of those leaves within the treatment branch. And then on the control branches, we didn't have any artificial galls. We then added 30 adult psyllids to every experimental sleeve. In this case, the sleeves were just left out in the field for five weeks. And we then went back after five weeks and harvested all of those branches, including the bags, took them back to the lab and then searched inside the bags to see how many psyllids, particularly nymphs, had survived for that period of time. So on the left here, you can see what a treatment branch looked like before it went into one of its sleeves. And on the right, you see something very similar to what we saw um, in the growth chamber experiment. When we open up one of those artificial galls, we see a large amount of psyllid activity, particularly late in star nymphs. And what the data showed us overall was that between those treatment branches and the control branches, we didn't see significant differences in the number of surviving nymphs but we did see significant differences in the number of late instar nymphs. And that's particularly important because in many of our releases across years of this biological control program, we've often seen large numbers of eggs being laid by the adults. We've seen large numbers of early instar nymphs, but then we, sent, we seem to see a kind of huge population die back and we see very few of these mature nymphs. So it's getting them through those really sensitive and vulnerable stages that's been the the tricky thing. So we think by creating these artificial galls, we've allowed uh, psyllids to get through those stages. And this is kind of highly positive uh, and reassuring. Another thing we saw during this experiment, just kind of as an aside, was that of the 60 branches that we sleeved, about 10 of them created side branches during the experiment. And those side branches were fed on by psyllids, and then they created real galls, like you can see on the left-hand side here. When we compared the number of psyllid nymphs that were supported by branches that had these side branches with real galls and branches that didn't, we saw highly significant increases in the number of psyllids that survived with those real galls present. So what this experiment shows us is that not only do these artificial galls help psyllid survival, but they're no substitute for the real thing. And it's a good sign that if we can get this real galling happening in field sites, it will have a huge impact on uh, how well uh, these insects do in the long term. So just to finish off with some kind of major broad implications for the biological control program, releases of these Murakami psyllids have already been the most successful in the program's history. So we have some releases uh, here in Canada, but also in the UK and in the Netherlands where uh, we have permission to release these psyllids. And early monitoring science have been much better than with previous uh, psyllid lines. So we're very happy with that. Based on the experiments we've done here and some previous work, releases of these Murakami psyllids should take place early in the growth season or in conjunction with cutting treatments. And that's to make sure that the presence of early instar nymphs coincides with the presence of very young developing leaves. And that's how we're going to uh, maximize the amount of leaf roll galling either by getting the, the psyllids on very early when the plants are growing early in the season, or by encouraging uh, young leaf growth by performing cutting treatments. So finally, the presence of these leaf roll galls seems to have really high potential to improve psyllid survival in the field. So I'm hopeful that in a couple of years time, if I'm talking to you again about knotweed biological control, we'll have better news about long-term establishment of these, these insects and maybe some some beneficial effects. So again, thank you very much for listening. And if there's any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. 
Thanks so much, Ian. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have just come in. Uh, so I'll read the first one. Do the other two strains of psyllids not form leaf roll galls at all? So it's complicated. It's not, it's not that they don't uh, form leaf roll galls at all, but much, much less so. Um, the main strains that we've used in the past have been the Kyushu strain, uh, which performs best on Japanese knotweed. And that produces very few uh, leaf roll galls. Um, it's not unheard of, but but quite rare. When we, we rear them in the lab, we'll still see virtually no leaf roll galls when the density of, of psyllids on the plants is very high. The other strain, the Hokkaido strain, has produced some leaf roll galls in the past, mostly on giant knotweed, um, which is not so much of a problem um, out east here. Uh, and so it hasn't been released a, a huge amount in the east uh, of Canada. Um, but neither of them have ever produced leaf roll galls to anything like the same extent that these Murakami psyllids do. So it's, it really is kind of a, a sea change in, in terms of how we can potentially utilize uh, the leaf roll galls. Okay. Um, well, it looks like we are just coming up on time for our break. There is another, um, looks like a really great question in the Q&A. So if you did want to uh, type an answer, um, please go ahead. Um, but for now, I'll just uh, thank you again, Ian, so much for joining us. Perfect. No, I'll go over to the Q&A now. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Okay, so um, as I said, we are now coming up on our break, um, just 10 minutes. Uh, thank you so much for joining this session. Our next session will begin at three o'clock on developments in research and management in aquatic invasive plants. Uh, if you want our um, news, uh, events, um, notifications and such directly to your inbox, um, please head to our website, invasivespeciescenter.ca. You can sign up, you'll get our quarterly newsletter, bi-weekly media and research scans, um, and also invites to events just like this one. Thank you everyone, see you after the break.